I've entitled this uh, homily, Jesus Mean and Wild, Three Mission Priorities, and it's based on Mark chapter 1, 29 to 39. The last time I was in China, I visited the grave of one of my heroes. Robert Morrison's mortal remains lie in a small churchyard in Macau, just across the Pearl River from Hong Kong. Robert grew up in an austere Scottish Presbyterian home and when he told his parents he wanted to become a missionary they were distraught. His mother insisted that young Robert promise that he would not go abroad while she was still alive. Robert was obedient and waited until she died before beginning his theological studies in London uh, at the Gosport uh, Academy. The London Mission Society accepted Robert in 1805 and he continued his studies in medicine, astronomy and Chinese. When his father fell ill, seriously ill, his brothers and sisters pleaded with him to return to Scotland. Robert loved his father but he wrote this letter. Honoured father, brother and sisters, the account of my father's leg growing worse and worse concerns me but what can I do? I look to my God and my Father's God. You advise me to return home. I thank you for your good intentions. May the Lord bless you for them. But I have no inclination to do so. Having set my hand to the plough, I would not look back. It has pleased the Lord to prosper me so far and grant me favour in the eyes of this people hard decision. In 1807 he was ordained and sailed for Canton or uh, Gaonzo as it's known today. He was just 25 years old. Two years later he met and married Mary and their first child John was born a year later but sadly died at birth. Two more children followed and then Mary became pregnant again but died in childbirth along with the child. Despite his grief and loneliness, Morrison wrote home that he, that is a missionary, should endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ and to complain of difficulties inseparably connected with the work is unworthy of him. Robert himself died aged 52 in 1834. In those 27 years in China, Robert baptised just 10 Chinese believers. That's about one every three years. You, one might ask, was the pain and the suffering worth it? Well, it depends on our perspective. It depends on our priorities. In our opening verses from Mark's Gospel, in our lectionary readings for today, we encounter what Mark Galley describes as Jesus mean and wild. He writes, nearly everywhere we turn in the Gospel of Mark, we find a Jesus who storms in and out of people's lives, making implicit or explicit demands, and in general making people feel mighty uncomfortable. For example, Jesus sternly charges or strictly orders people he heals, Mark 1.43, 3.12, 5.43, 8.30. He looks upon religious leaders with anger and grief, Mark 3.5. He destroys a herd of swine while showing no regret, providing no compensation to the owner, Mark 5. He overturns the money tables in the temple in a moment of rage, Mark 11. He rebukes Peter as demonic, Mark 8. He's indignant with the disciples, Mark 10. He says the Sadducees are biblically and spiritually ignorant, Mark 12. He describes the entire generation as faithless, Mark 9. Jesus repeatedly makes it clear that following him will entail suffering and even death, Mark 9. On one occasion, his appeal to the crowds included this promise. Whoever wants to be my disciple 
must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. That's Mark 8, 34, 35. I wonder how many takers there were on that day. In our gospel reading today, Mark 1, 29 to 39, we're given an insight into Jesus' priorities. And the verses describe what might be called a, a typical day in the life of Jesus. What were his priorities? Mark 1, 32. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Just picture the scene. The whole town gathered at the door. Hundreds of distressed people were gathering around Peter's home. The noise and the commotion must have reached a fever pitch as people jostled and jostled one another to get near the door. But why did people wait until dark to come? Because it had been the Sabbath. The day begins at 6 a.m. and ends around 6 p.m. The Sabbath was considered over when three stars were visible in the sky. So when the sun had set and the stars were beginning to glow, people carried their sick and suffering relatives to meet Jesus. Jesus appears from the door and is immediately surrounded by the sick and dying. We're told he heals many, one person at a time, and drives out many demons too. So it must have been pretty late into the night at the point where Jesus retires, exhausted. Many of the people will have gone home, some reluctantly disappointed, or perhaps they camped out nearby. The desperate ones would be back at dawn. So what would you expect Jesus to do? What were his priorities? His first priority spending time alone with God. What happened the next morning, Mark 1, 35? Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Remember, Jesus had got to bed late. The evening surgery had begun at sunset, yet Mark tells us Jesus got up while it was still dark, left his warm bed, and went out to a cold, solitary place to pray to the Father. We don't know what he prayed. What is more instructive is the fact that he got up in the early morning while it was still dark and found a place to be alone to talk to the Father. If Jesus felt he needed to do it, how much more do we? Somewhere free from distractions like the phone, emails, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Can you cope with that? Being alone with God? In silence? When I was single, I lived alone. It was, I was very punctual at having a quiet time before breakfast. Then there was a, a 25 year interlude called family. Now I have to use my watch to vibrate to remind me when to go to bed and when to wake up. We're all wired differently, but there is nothing more important than cultivating our personal relationship with God the Father. In times of solitude, with an open Bible, in prayer. It's because God's word is read, God's voice is heard. When better than at the beginning of the day? I know that if I don't make time before I begin my day, I'll never find time afterwards. And the precious opportunity to commune is lost. So like Jesus, make it your first priority. Jesus' first priority, spending time alone with God. His second priority, 
training the disciples for mission. Verse 36. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let's go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Simon is exasperated. You can notice that from the exclamation mark in the text. There's even a hint of criticism in his response when they eventually track Jesus down in this lonely spot somewhere away from the village. The people must have been gathering again and there was great anticipation and expectation in the air. Everyone is looking for you. Could be roughly translated as you're late, Dr. Jesus. The waiting room is packed out. You're playing havoc with the appointments we've set up for you. Please hurry up. Everyone's so excited about what you're going to do for them today. But your delay is embarrassing for our public image. You see, the tone suggests that after a night of prayer, Jesus would have been a little more compassionate toward the crowds of sick and dying gathering in the village below. But no. The disciples are in for a shock, a rude awakening. Gently but firmly, Jesus explains the agenda for the day. Jesus wasn't going back to heal the rest. It was time to move on. Jesus would not be deflected from his priorities, even when there was so much human need around him. But notice Jesus says, let us go because this was a group training exercise. Jesus was training his disciples. Training played a vital part in Jesus' ministry. That's why he invested so much time with them alone, away from the crowds. He took time to explain his actions, to unpack his parables, to answer their questions and prepare them for a future without him. Because Jesus was committed to multiplication, not addition. Multiplication. We see this in another verse in the epistles, 2 Timothy 2.2, where Paul says to Timothy, the things you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses pass on to faithful people who can teach others also. How many generations are mentioned there? Four. It's multiplication. Paul, Timothy, faithful people who can teach others also. It's plural, it's multiplying, it's reproduction. Succession planning played a significant part of Jesus' three-year ministry because Jesus knew it would only be through his disciples and as they embraced his priorities and passed those on to others that the world, the whole world, would hear the good news of the gospel. Today the word Christian is much devalued. I prefer the term Christ follower because it, a Christian, a biblical Christian, is a disciple, a learner, a follower of Jesus. And if someone's not following Jesus' teaching, they're not following Jesus. Maturity doesn't come by accumulating more and more knowledge about God. Maturity comes by reproducing ourselves. One of the, the bishops on our Peacemaker Board of Reference uh, serves in Rwanda. He has an interesting take on ordination and ministry. Many people come forward for training and want to be involved in Christian ministry, but he won't ordain someone until they've already planted a church. In the UK, people get ordained after three or two years training for ministry. But in Rwanda, in this particular diocese, you have to have already planted a church before he, the bishop, will recognise your ministry and ordain you. I think that's a more biblical approach. Jesus' priorities must determine our own. Jesus' first priority, spending time alone with God. Jesus' second priority, training the disciples for mission.
And his third priority mentioned in these verses, teaching the good news of the kingdom. Verse 38, let's go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Jesus came to preach that the kingdom of God was near because the servant king had arrived. And it was the Hebrew scriptures that provided his scripture texts. He pointed to the fact that he, Jesus, the servant king, the suffering servant, was central to God's purposes and prophecies in the Hebrew Scriptures. Why did Jesus cast out the demons as well? Because they stood in the way of people hearing and responding to that message. Jesus healed the sick and raised the dead to authenticate his claims to be the Messiah, just as the scriptures predicted. There's that one occasion where <coughs> friends of this paralysed man let him down through the roof before Jesus and in front of all the religious leaders who were there to trap Jesus. And Jesus, knowing what they were thinking, looks at them and says, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? And he says, so that you would know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, I say, get up and walk. The miracles authenticated his authority. You see, his miracles of healing and deliverance caused great interest, but they were not his priority. In fact, often the miracles got in the way of because people sought health and wealth, just as they do today, rather than forgiveness and eternal life. Now, it's important to stress that Jesus didn't use healings as a means of evangelism. It's why the whole concept of power evangelism through healings and miracles is nonsense. It's unbiblical. What does Jesus say to the healed leper in Mark 1? Don't tell anyone. What does he say to the evil spirit in Mark 1? Be quiet. Again, verse 34, he wouldn't let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Jesus knew who he was. The demons knew who he was. But the people didn't yet understand what kind of saviour he would be. That's why the first half of Mark's gospel is all about who is Jesus. And it's only at that point where his disciples understand who Jesus is, the Messiah, the Son of God, that he begins to teach them about why he came. Mark chapters 1 to 8 are about who is Jesus. Mark 9 to 16 are about why Jesus came. So Jesus wouldn't let the demons lead people astray. Why did Jesus come? Verse 38. Let's go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. And that's why I suggest the first priority of every bishop and every pastor is to preach. It's not to preside at communion. It's not to get involved in social action. It's certainly not to build cathedrals and, uh, and uh, church buildings. The priority is to preach and proclaim the gospel. Jim Packer, the author of that famous book, Knowing God, said this, Doctrinal preaching certainly bores the hypocrites, but it is only doctrinal preaching that will save Christ's sheep. The preacher's job is to proclaim the faith, not to provide entertainment for unbelievers. In other words, to feed the sheep rather than amuse the goats. Jesus came to teach and fulfill God's purpose as revealed in Scripture because the Word of God reveals the will of God. Through Scripture, Jesus led people back into a right relationship with God by grace, through faith, for good works. He came to call people to repent, to turn around, away from their sin, and come to Him, their Saviour, to trust in Him, their Lord. 
because Jesus came to die in our place. The only person who was ever born to die. He came to ransom us, to redeem us, to reconcile us to God in fulfilment of all the scriptures. And when Jesus was crucified, how many followers did he have? What had he achieved? He left behind only a handful of disciples, entrusting them with responsibility for what? Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Multiplication through the disciples. Jesus commanded them to take the gospel to the entire world by reproducing themselves. Think about the enormity of that. That is what they achieved by God's grace. And that is why we are here. And that's why Robert Morrison went to China. What did he accomplish? In 27 years ministry, he baptised just 10 new believers. Doesn't sound a fruitful ministry. But he was a pioneer. He was the first Protestant missionary to China. And in his spare time, he translated the entire Bible into Chinese. He founded the first theological college in China, the Anglo-Chinese College in Malacca. And by the time he died in 1834, through his efforts, that tiny church in China possessed a Bible, a grammar of the Chinese language, translations of the Book of Common Prayer and other Christian texts, many shorter works on Chinese history, culture, literature, a history of Christian missions among the Chinese, a vocabulary of the Cantonese dialect, and a handful, just a handful, of indigenous disciples who were trained, who were resourced, and who were dedicated to proclaim the good news. Robert, by God's grace, established the foundation of the church in China. And it became a church that survived the Boxer Revolution when all foreign missionaries were either killed or expelled. A church that survived the Chinese invasion, the Japanese invasion, and the internment camps during the Second World War. A church that multiplied under communist persecution. A church today, according to the Chinese authorities, of just of those who are members of the Three Self Movement, that's the established above ground church of over 40 million members. That means it's larger than the Communist Party. And when you add in the underground church, and it's hard to speculate how large that is, we must be looking at least 100 million Christians. Jesus' priorities were really very simple. Build, send, win. Talking to God the Father, training the disciples in mission, and teaching people how to enter the kingdom of God. Win, build, send. Doesn't matter where you begin on that circle, but once you're on it, you're replicating yourself. Winning, building, sending to win and build in order to send, to win, to build. These were the priorities of Jesus, and by God's grace, may they remain ours too. A prayer from the Book of Common Prayer. Almighty and eternal God, so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills, that we may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated to you, and then use us, we pray, as you will, and always to your glory and the welfare of your people, through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.